series from the makers of A Sanctified Art entitled Close to Home. And in this series, Close to Home acknowledges the already but not yet tension of our faith that Emmanuel, God is with us, and yet God's promised day, our everlasting home, is not fully here. It names our deep longing for God to come close to us. In this Advent season, we may be comforted by the one who dwells intimately with us, expanding safety and sanctuary for everyone wandering far from home. So may we come home, wherever that is found, to live with joy, hope, and courage. Now come closer and hear these words from the Gospel of Luke. I will be reading chapter 3, verses 1 through 18 from the New International Version of the Bible. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetriarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetriarch of Eturia, and Tyronius, Lanesius, tetranarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as, as it is written in the book of the words Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make path straight for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low, the crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children of Abraham. The axe is already the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What shall we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized and said, Teacher, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required, he replied. Soldiers came to him and asked, What should we do? He replied, Don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. But be content with your pay and act with justice. The people were waiting expectantly and all were wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit his fork in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his burn. And many other words John extorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this morning is traditionally known as Gaudete Sunday, and Gaudete is a Latin imperative commanding one to rejoice. If you noticed Anna and Rolando, um, today's candle on the Advent wreath is actually different than the three purple that you see up here. Normally, a purple candle is lit on Sundays in Advent to represent the penance we should be experiencing in this time of preparation and waiting. Advent is a time for all Christ followers to reflect and to prepare as every week we have more and more light grow on the Advent wreath. But today we take a break from the penitent purple and are given a lighter, more joyful rose or pink color to represent joy. 
And the writers of the Old and New Testament call for all believers to cultivate joy in the midst of this weary, broken world. The prophets Zechariah and Isaiah say to sing for joy, rejoice, and shout to the Lord with all of our hearts. The Apostle Paul tells his church in Philippi to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice, no matter what the circumstances. For many years, I struggled with the biblical command to be joyful in all circumstances. Whenever I am told to do something, I have this tiny rebellious side of me that wants to stomp my foot and say no. Additionally, I've always struggled because forcing a fake smile and telling everyone how happy you are feels kind of inauthentic when that's not the reality I'm experiencing. In the last month alone, we have faced a newer, more contagious COVID variant that has spread across the globe. We have suffered eight school shootings across the United States, making the total count for this year 31. And we are continuing to face a lot of economic and political uncertainty. How are we supposed to rejoice in these circumstances? How are we supposed to rejoice when we're grieving the loss of a spouse, a parent, or a friend? What songs of gladness could we honestly sing when fear and exhaustion plague our lives? What then should we do? I believe the answer lies in the words John the Baptist speaks to us in our scripture reading this morning from the Gospel of Luke. At first glance, this morning's scripture seems harsh, and out of place. I mean, John the Baptist straight up calls us a brood of vipers. Not something you would expect to hear on Joy Sunday in Advent, and not normally something you'd see on a Christmas cross-stitch pillow or a glittery wall hanging at Hobby Lobby. For those of you who don't know who John the Baptist is, He was a wild, yippy-dippy, hippie beast of a man who dressed in camel's hair, smelled probably really bad, ate locust bugs, and lived in the wilderness. He didn't own a hairbrush, and he liked honey. That's about the only thing I feel like he and I had in common. He's not always someone that people think about at Christmas time. Rudolph, sure. Mary and Joseph and the donkey? Absolutely. But John, this radical baptizer? Not usually someone that you see in the Christmas section at Target, even with the religious cards. But the truth is, John the Baptist is one of the most important characters in the season of Advent, and his message, while at first glance seemingly harsh, is ultimately a message of joy. And if we have hearts to receive and ears to listen, I believe we will discover this morning how to create and cultivate deep spiritual joy. You see, right at the beginning of this passage, we see that the word of God did not come to emperors, governors, rulers, and high priests of the time. Instead, the word of God came to an outsider living in the wilderness. The one living on the margins of society. A news spread that if you went to the wilderness, you could be a part of what God was doing. You see, last week we talked about how God was silent for so many years, and now people were excited because God was speaking, and they wanted to hear and be a part of what God was doing. And these people who were so excited and filled with newfound hope were not the ones who had the money and the privilege and the power They did not have the military backing them up. They were the ones that were weary from the iniquities that the powerful had perpetuated. They were the ones that were longing to be rescued for the injustices that the empire and the religious elite had created. And John tells the crowd that the Messiah is coming and that it was time to get ready, to wake up to start bearing fruit, and to repent. And after this very tough sermon, the people don't leave. They don't walk away angry or tell John to sit on a bunch of tacks or send him a really nasty email. 
Instead, they stay and ask him, what should we do then? Where do we go from here? And this is the first nugget of wisdom I believe that this scripture text teaches us. The true joy is born when we live lives of humility and repentance. When we seek God instead of trying to be God. When we turn our hearts back to the Lord when we've wandered astray and we're really honest with ourselves, with each other, and with the Lord. There's a reason that God's word did not appear to the emperors and high priests of the time. Their hearts were hardened with pride and arrogance. They had convinced themselves that they didn't need God. They had created their own. But John the Baptist was a humble man whose life was solely focused on listening to the Lord and following the path that God had for him. He wasn't pointing to himself like so many leaders in his day were doing. He was pointing the people to the Lord. And the crowd saw the joy that John had and wanted it for themselves. So they responded to his message with repentance and humility. They were willing to do what it took to get ready for the Savior. And John shocks them all with his answer. Instead of replying, start the revolution, live in the wilderness, eat bugs like me, he says, go home. Go home and love your families. Go home to your neighbors, your careers, your colleagues. Stop running away. And stop thinking that God could not be present in your normal routines of your everyday life. Instead of thinking that the holy is out there, realize that the holy ground is the ground beneath your feet. What John is suggesting to the crowd is that true joy is found in the ordinary and everyday We don't have to look way out there for the kingdom of heaven. It's here in our homes, with our families, in our jobs, and at the grocery store, in the post office. It's in the way that we live and work. It's in the way we have patience and grace and forgiveness for one another. True joy is found in the margins of society in giving instead of receiving, in building a home for all and making sure that everyone has what they need, in not resting and being complacent with all that we have, but thinking about those who are going without, feeding the hungry, giving a voice to the silence and the oppressed, speaking truth to power and protecting the vulnerable. That is true joy that John is speaking of. Being part of something bigger than yourself. Being part of the work that the Lord is inviting all of us to do. There is nothing more joyful than that. The thing is, as kooky as John the Baptist was, he really understood what real joy is. Joy is not circumstantial. It's not to be confused with happiness, which has to do with your situations and your conditions. And joy is definitely not cheap. It's not an illusion that commercials are trying to sell us or a lie that we have to force a smile all the time. True joy comes from humility and repentance and being ready to do the work in this weary world from a relief of laying down our burdens at the foot of the cross and realizing that we don't have to have all the answers. We don't have to try and be God, of have everything figured out, that we can go and run and turn back to the one who wants to be with us. A modern-day John the Baptist is a Jesuit priest by the name of Gregory Boyle. Father Greg is the founder of Homeboy Industries, a gang intervention, rehabilitation, and reentry program based in Los Angeles, California. Homeboy Industries have incentives including reducing recidivism, 
reducing substance abuse, improving social connectedness, housing safety, and reunifying families. And Father Greg has been ministering in the modern day wilderness with the folks in the margins of society for the last 30 years. But for the first six years of his ministry, he made the mistake of trying to save every young man and woman trapped in gang life. Eventually, he realized that it wasn't enough that he wanted them to have a better life. They needed to want it for themselves and to make the conscious decision to change their life. In his book, Tattoos on the Heart, Father Greg writes, we cannot turn the light switch on for anyone, but we all own flashlights. On any given day, we know where to aim them for one another. We do not rescue anyone at the margins. But go figure, if we stand at the margins, we are all rescued by God. No mistake about it. As Christ followers, we are collectively called to build and repair the structures of society, to be kingdom builders for righteousness and justice for all. But we have to remember two things. One, just like John the Baptist, he couldn't force anyone to want true repentance, to really start the revolution by being kingdom builders at home. He knew people needed to want that for themselves. And two, we have to remember, just as Father Greg did, that God is the one that does the saving, not us. So what then should we do? This is the question the people asked John in the wilderness, and it is the question we should continue asking today. This Advent, as we wait in the darkness and in the cold and look forward to the light of the Messiah, are we engaging in a kind of intense self-reflection that leads to righteous action? Or are we complacent, sluggish, smug? Are we running like the crowds in John's story, towards genuine repentance and transformation? Or are we turning away offended that repentance has a place in the Christmas story at all? The word of the Lord came to John in the wilderness. May it come to us too. And just like John, may we bring glad tidings of great joy, preparing the way of the Lord. Amen.